Good work, everyone, and uh, welcome, everyone. You know, now you're all tzaddikim, totally clean, totally pure. That Yom Kippur cleansed you out, so Yevaldik, And of course, we are on this rare year where Shabbos falls between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. So there's a stickle of a shayla of what, what is the Zrizim Makdim el Mitzvah? Does it mean uh, right after Yom Kippur? Or does it mean right after Shabbos? Uh Tom is right after Yom Kippur. But anyhow, be it as it may. We start with Zat Hashem with Sipo from Maise from Baal Shem Hakodesh. It says Gula, you know, to, to say Maise Baal Shem Hakodesh on Motsi Shabbos is Gula for a good week, definitely for a good year. And here goes. There was a town where a very, very wealthy person lived, and he was obviously just you know, just wealthy, but, you know, being that he was wealthy, that he was, you know, was very honored, he was very mechubedik. And he said in shul, he took out, you know, uh, a tabak box, a snuff box, as they say, and he, you know, gave it over to all the people around. And there was a poor man who was sitting by the, the opening of the shul, he saw how the, the rich person, you know, moves around the snuff box to everyone. So he came close to take a stickle tabak, and but the the gvir, the, the, the wealthy guy, uh, took the box and closed it. In other words, he let him, and the poor man went. The pauper went back to his seat, very embarrassed. From that moment on, the luck of the rich man started going down, and the luck of the poor man started going up. Bechlal the saying says, Gula, you know, if somebody embarrasses you, you know, not to say anything. And he says, Chaim Kanevsky said, he gave an answer to somebody, he says, uh, he didn't have children. I don't know what the story was, but he told him, get a bracha from somebody who has been really insulted and didn't answer. And he went, he took, he went to shul and somebody was like, somebody really washed the floor without a guy. And um, so he, uh, and he didn't say anything. So this person went to him and says, can you please give me a brocha for children? And Taki had children. Uh, so it's very difficult when somebody insults you, not only not to say anything then and there, but not to harbor, you know, this, this, this kpeda inside. It's very, very difficult because it's, it's an immense esrotse in the Shemaim. You know that uh, that um, you know this. There's a very fi- famous mimer from the Vilna Gaon that said that uh, at any time that a person uh, keeps his mouth shut, uh, he's zoyche, you know, to a light that no angels can attain that light. Now, the language you use is that he bars his mouth from speaking. So the post of shot is, is that, why well, you have to bar your mouth? I mean, just close your mouth, don't say anything. He says, no, bars your mouth means that somebody, you know, either insults you or you have uh, um, an opportunity to crack, you know, to crack one a joke that will, you know, some a witticism 
that will just go through all the the, the barriers, all the, the the chinks in the armor, you know, of the other person and really hit home. You know, it, it's a it's a special satisfaction of being a, you know, I said that thing that actually, uh, and he bars his mouth as he zoich to a light that no angel merits this kind of light. So I heard Rabbi Avram Yosef, the brother of Rabbi Tzak Yosef, the chief rabbi. So what does it mean that he is Zoyche? He says, Yiske, that he will be Zoyche, you know, in the future. What's Peshat Zoyche? He says, no, no. It means that at that very moment, he says, at that very moment, he, when you feel that there's something that you want to say, either in a marital situation, or in your wife says something, which is the most common, uh, or somebody says something and you don't say anything, you have an urge to answer and you don't answer, it means at that very instant, you get that light, which means you will be able to ask for whatever it is that you want and you will get it. The problem is that usually, you know, first, I'm not even talking about when it is that, that, uh, um, that, 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 you know, when it, when you answer something, that's a separate thing. But uh, even when you don't answer, you know, you're busy with not answering. If you had the freedom of mind of when you feel that urge to answer, and you don't answer, to quickly ask a Kodesh Baruch of whatever it is that you want, you'll get what at that moment, the gates are open for you. You know, but, you know, my wife comes and says something to me that makes me feel like a failure. So either I answer or I don't answer. And that kind of struggle, this kind of inner struggle keeps me busy and wastes that precious time of being asked being of asking for this bottle for whatever it is that I want. The question of why that, I mean, someone here asked the question of why this is something that happens most in marital situations. Well, first of all, you know, you a goofer, you know, is what your wife is like you. And her, nobody knows you the way your wife knows you. Nobody, not even you. The only thing is that she doesn't, she cannot put it into words what it is that she knows about you. And her job is to prod you to get to where you need to get. And the, the, somebody once asked me, what is the number one attribute that a person, that the husband needs to have? in order to have a successful marriage. So I said, in my opinion, the most important attribute is to be able to suck it up when your wife tells you something that makes you feel like two cents, makes you feel like a failure. Not just necessarily say something. You come home from work. You worked hard all day. You expect I'll be coming home, be warm food, the children will be bathed. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is you have in mind. You're coming home. There's a pile of laundry the size of Mount Everest. And your wife is on top of the mound and she has a cell phone in her ear. And she's yakety yakking, you know, nine ways to Sunday. There's no food, the, the dishes weren't done. Whatever it is that's going on, you take a look, you take a look, and your wife just, you know, looks over her shoulder and says to a friend, it's just my husband, it's okay, keep on, you can keep on talking. <laughs> and you'll feel like you're blowing up, you know, like, what do you mean? Just my husband. What do you mean, just my husband? <laughs> Makes me feel like a total nothing. 
this is, let me just fix this a little bit. Okay. This is the most important attribute that the husband needs to have to be able to take it and to be present. You know, not to run away, not to retort from, um, from anger, from, you know, from itnakdut, from objection. Hey, what's going on? Where's my dinner? Or, okay, that's it. I'm not talking to her. I'm just, I'm off. Finish. Retreating into yourself. Don't do any of that. Just be there. Agree within yourself to feel humiliated. Your wife doesn't mean to humiliate you. That humiliation is something that you feel between you and your. She has some kind of a taina. Sometimes the taina is not really even a taina. Sometimes a complaint is not a real complaint. It's just that this is usually the way that women, you know, um, how shall I say, it, sort of equalize, you know, emotionally. You know, you can speak to your wife. And you feel like, wow, she really got me. She understood. We had a cathartic moment and wow, she really understands that. And the next thing she gives it to you and you really, she, like she didn't hear a, a word you said. Whatever happened to that conversation that you had. But the answer is that, that she needs to go up and to go down in order to settle things within herself. That's, that's the way that women handle things emotionally. And because Boko created them that way. And it's fine. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. What, what, what kind of attribute is that for a husband? I mean, what is it? I mean, uh, what, I get married to get humiliated? What's the story with this? What's the, uh, what's the point? The point is, the point is that when you wife, your wife says something that makes you feel inadequate, And you accept, okay, A, the fact that I feel inadequate doesn't mean that I am inadequate. It just means that I feel inadequate. Okay, that's point number one. But the fact that I'm standing here and I'm accepting it and I'm not running anywhere, because that's the way that men settle things emotionally between them and themselves. They retreat. You know, many times, you know, women, you know, they see asking like, how are you? When somebody else is hurt, like, how do you feel? You are you okay? You this is a, and man says that just do me a favor, keep a distance right now. I need to handle it. Men go back and forth, women go up and down emotionally. That's the way it is. Both are making mistakes. When your wife goes up and then she goes down, that she's settling things within herself in order, you know, to to become balanced again. Women need to know the husbands. Retreat. Don't keep on going after him, asking, no, no, really, tell me. Because when you said, you know, I'll be okay, I don't want to talk about it, they hear, you know, you don't love me. <laughs> what can you do? That's the way they understand it. That's the way they hear it. Because women empathize. Men, how do they machazek one another? Eh, my brother, it's nothing for you. You're going to get over it. It's not a big deal. Forget about it. It's nothing. Women know, you know, they, they, they sort of like, they come and they, they unload and they play role. You know, two women are sitting there and one of them is talking and saying, you know, this and this and that. And the other go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. No, really? I can't believe it. Uh-huh. And then they change role. And that this one is, you know, is, is pouring it out. And this one says, uh-huh. And that's the, way that, that's the way they work. So women, you know, they, they, they interpret you know, getting closer when things are tough as empathy, as love, as a man is exactly the opposite. You know, when I am in distress, whatever it is, let go. You know, just stay away. That's one of the reasons of one of the, the, the explosions between men and women is that the woman keeps on going after the man. No, no, really, because it means like, you don't love me. I'm asking you how you are. I see that you're and you don't want to talk to me. So she keeps on coming closer and closer and closer. 
until the man explodes, just leave me alone, you know, it's like a, and she's shocked. What did I do? I just wanted to love you, just wanted to be close to you. <laughs> the women also have to learn. But the thing is that a man can help his wife in such a case, when he feels that he needs to retreat, tell her, listen, right now, I need to retreat because that's the way I process things, but I'll be back. Don't worry. I'll, I'll be back. It'll be fine. And she'll go, ah, oh, okay. When you're taking it from your wife and you're not running anywhere, this is a gift that you are giving her, your presence. She may, you know, like whatever it is that they, they in, in, in the 30s or in the 20s, whatever it is, before they had these all these explicit movies, you know. So, you know, if they, there would be, you know, this this mushy scenes in movies, so you, you had the, the woman like banging on the chest of the man and he wouldn't go anywhere and that would lead what whatever. That, that's the thing that happens. It's fine. Stay there. It's a gift of being there of presence. Essentially, women interpret it as you're not being a woman. You know, oh, I'm sorry, I, you know, I got hurt. I can't believe you hurt my feelings. This is how they interpret when a man goes when he gets all upset. Forget. You come in, your wife didn't did the dish, do the dishes, didn't cook dinner, whatever. Do you know what happened to her today? You know what, what went on? Maybe that friend that she is on the phone now is actually saving the day for her. You know, come in, feel, feel what you feel, agree to feel it. And look at her and says, is there anything I can do to help? Whatever. That's, a, that's usually not the thing that, that uh, they teach in Hassan classes, but I believe they share. Anyhow, be that as it may, the story is that the rich man started going down and the poor man started going up. Uh, not a, a lot of time passed and that poor person became extremely wealthy. And the wealthy man started to become so poor that you know, he started he had to beg. And the town where he lived, where people knew him, knew he you know, was a very rich. So they were honor him, they were giving more than they used to give to other poor people. At the end, you know, things got so bad that he, he got together with a band of poor people that were moving from town to town. That's the way people used to do in those days. You can see that uh, the Sipora Mysis, the Mysa from, from, from uh, Seven Beggars, is also the same thing. The beggars all you know, con you know, congregated together, they went from town to town together, whatever it's, it's uh, that's the way things used to be at those times. And they went from town to town until they came to the town of the Baal Shem Tov. Now, by the Baal Shem Tov, the way things ran is there was a minute to give the poor people a certain amount, you know, predetermined amount that the Gabbai would give all, all his own without asking the Baal Shem Tov. But if came a guest that had to get more than usual, the Gaba would ask the Baal Shem Tov how much to give him. So that time, this ex tycoon came over, and the Gaba gave everybody, you know, the usual allotment. And when this Gvir came, he gave him like everybody. And this ex-tycoon ref refused to accept this. And he said, every place they give him more. They give me more. So the guy said, I don't have permission to give you more. So he says, no, 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 you have to give me more. Every place where I go, you know, he still retained his pride from being a wealthy man, you know, maybe you know, like you used to have these these uh, these stickers on cars. Uh, 
in the back of the car, you know, they're old clunkers. It's just a sick used to say, you know, maybe I'm driving a clunker, but I'm ahead of you. You know, so this guy, you know, is, is, is maybe I'm poor, but I'm getting more than the other poor people get. I don't know. Anyhow. So he said, okay, you have to wait until I can go into the Baal Shem Tov and ask him, ask him what to do. So that person waited. And when he waited, when, when, when the Gabay came out, he gave him real, you know, a generous gift. Again, the person would not accept it. He says he doesn't want to get any gifts. He wants to go to Baal Shem Tov himself. So when he actually went into the Baal Shem Tov, and he told the Masha'at the whole story, you know, how he was very rich and he became poor. And he asked the Baal Shem Tov and Eitzah, you know, what, what can I do, you know, to get back to the way I was? So Baal Shem Tov asked him, do you remember this Misa with the, with, the, with the snuff box that you shot it off before the face of that poor person? He says, because you do, did that, they pass in the Shemaim that all your wealth will go back, we will go to that, this, this poor person, and you will take his place as a, as a poor person. That's the reason why you're poor. And he said, yeah, he remembers that. He remembers that nice. And he says, from that moment on, his luck started going downhill. He says, what's the Takana? What are you going to do? So Shantel says, listen, there's no other way to fix this except for you to come and ask him for a little topic and he won't give it to you. And if he doesn't give it to you, all your wealth will come back to you. But if he will give you, you won't be able to take your wealth back. Then the Balshanto gave him a really nice gift and he went away. So that rich person didn't say anything. He kept in his heart. He he found out that very very soon that rich person who used to be that poor person that he snapped the snuffbox on his face is going is making a big chasm to his door. He's making a big suda for the poor people. This is how the wealthy people in those days when they make chasm they make a special suda that every person every poor person can come specifically for the poor person. And he went and he sat together with all the poor persons. In the middle of the Suda, everybody started to dance. The, the father of the Kala went with one of the Chotanim to dance on the t- one of the tables. So the poor person, which, you know, this ex tycoon came to him, it came to him. So the father of the bride asked him, what do you want? So he says, he says, I would like uh, to, to, you know, schmeck a little tabak. So the father of the bride stopped his dancing. He took out his snuff box and he gave it to him. Go ahead. And when this ex tycoon saw it, he fainted on the spot. So the father of the, of the bride got really startled, got really scared. And, you know, Doe woke him up and he says, well, What happened? What's What's wrong? So that poor person, that ex tycoon, told him the whole story, how he snapped the box before him, and his muzzle went down, and he became beggar. And then he went to Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov said, "There's no way to fix this unless you, I ask you for a little tablet, and you won't give. And if you don't give it to me, then all the wealth will came back." So that rich person used to be poor, heard this and says, that's it. If that's the case, you're not going to beg, going around begging anymore. For as long as I'm alive, you will live with me. I will share whatever it is that I have with you. And he gave him money. And he says, please bring all your family members uh, and over here. And he bought him a house. And every Shabbos, he would give him whatever it is he needs. He gave him a paycheck every Shabbos that he needed. That's a story from the Baal Shem Tov for this week.
Okay. Let's bring up the Sicha Saran uh, for this week. As I said, it's not an easy one. Uh, in fact, it's pretty hard. But it has to do with Sukkos. And so let's let's go over here. Let's read from the beginning. This is Sicha 87. The Fri Prinas Ayomim Neiroim you know, the days of awe, it is befitting that we should have a beautiful Esri. Or there is a, a, a saying amongst people that every boy, every lad, has a beautiful wife. And the Esri is Malchus, is a wife, a woman. As it says in the Zoya College, in the Tikkunim, that the Esrog is Bechinas, Kulach Yofi Rayos is my, my, my mate, my wife, you are totally beautiful, Mumenbach, there's no blemish in you. This we're talking about the Esrog. And in the days of all, the Yom Neroim, Israel, are, they take on an aspect of a Nar, a lad, who hasn't fully matured yet. This says about Moshe Rabbeinu that when the door of Paray opened up the uh, you know the, the box that he was in, <clears throat> he opened it up and she says, now a, a lad is crying. Not a baby, but the Torah says a lad now, which is like a, a young, you know, a young, a young boy, you know, not a small boy, but a, a young man. And immediately, when she heard the Na Boyche that a lad is crying, immediately she was filled with compassion. It says in Tikkunim, that's why Rabbeinu says it is befitting that Am Yisrael will have a beautiful Esra. And he says, the more you cry, the more you get into the role of being Na Boyche. And we'll talk a little bit about what's the psha that you get into the role of being an abba. And Mimele, it's befitting to you that you have a beautiful esrit. Because what the Oilam says, that every lad has a beautiful woman. He says, you have to understand. And here, Rabino speaks about two separate inyonim. One of them is, what's the pshat? Why somebody was a penis lad? Is Zoyche to Aisha Yofo, a beautiful wife? Where does this come from? And then how this mechanism comes into place during Sukkot, where you get, you know, the, the beautiful Esri. They It's basically the same mechanism, but there's one uh, difference between them, as you'll notice. Uh, the regular quote unquote mechanism is, is that. You're a lad, and because you're a lad, you will see what it is that it means. You're zechet to have a isha yofa. During the nomina noy neroim, it's a situation that we get ourselves into. It's not our natural state. We are a state of moichin, we're a state of maturity. And what we do is we put ourselves into a state of ladhood, if there was such a thing. And this in itself gives us Esrog Noe, Isha Noe, which is one of the same thing. So let's go and read what it is that it is saying. He says, because that which the world says, that the people say, that, that every lad has a beautiful woman, you have to understand. He says, the main existence of the mental faculties of the Sechel is from the brain, but the brain gets it from the brain inside the bones, the bone marrow. The marrow inside the bone is a primordial brain. It's a very deep concept. And he says, you have to understand because the man seichel, you know, that power to reason, to understand and to think, is through the, the, the various uh, uh, enzymes 
and, and oils, as it were, of the body, that, that feeds the, the seichel. The seichel is burning out like, like, like a candle, you know, that, that flame that is burning on a, on a wick. And the wick itself, what are you burning? You're not burning the wick. You're burning the oil that the wick is bringing up. The same thing. And he says, and, and, and the, the, the oils of the body that make thinking possible, make the thought process possible, comes from the marrow in the bones. This is the main, the mainstay of the seichel, because the mainstay of the seichel is through the 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 moistures in the oils of the body, as it says in different places. Okay, so now we have the seichel feeds off oils and and emitters of the of the enzymes of the body, which comes from the bones. Now it says as follows. Thou can, that's for that reason. Mishahuna, anybody that is a bechina of a lad. What's Psata Bechina of a lad? What's the difference between a lad and somebody who's who is mature? His moichin is mature. What's the difference between them? The difference is Kimishuna, somebody who is a lad, ain't sichlo bishlenos. His seichel is not perfected. It means that his seichel has not used up the marrow from his bones. The majority of the marrow, the majority of the shamunius, the, of the oils, you know, that, that, that feeds the flame of the seichel is still in the bones. You're an unfinished project, as it were. The main marrow is still in the bones. Venisha Moyche Konos Bat Samus and his and his moich is still in the bones. Why ki and shoev moichoi mi moich shabat samus because your mind does not extract all the raw moich which is still in the bones. That's the reason why the man is not mature. The man is not perfected, because you haven't you haven't burnt up, you haven't you didn't extract all the oils from the marrow of the bones. That's the reason why the mind is not perfect. It's a, it's, it's, it's a childish mind, you know, it's, it's, it's not a mature mind. So it is found that what happens is it has this effect that the moich is still inside the bones. The bones are filled to the brim with moich. The bones are healthy. As they say, you know, when people get older, you know, the bones get brittle. You know, when somebody is very young, the bones are very strong. It's because the moich and that somos is still, because the moich didn't take out all the, all the potential sechel from the moich, the marrow on the bones. He says, that's why Alken Bazugoy, the, 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 the wife, the, the, the mate of that lad that is taken from the bones. Where did the wife come? Where, where did Chava come? Because Baruch took one of the, the you know, the, 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 the bones, the, 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 uh, the ribs of Odom Arishan and, and built a wife out of it. Which means, and all that plethora of moichin that is remained in the bones because it wasn't used up was given to her. So that's the source of her beauty. This is where she was taken from. Being that it was jam-packed, you know, topped up full to the gills with meth, that's why his, 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 his mate, his bride, is beautiful. Because the main beauty comes from the marrow and the chokhmah which is in the bones in a very, very primordial and, 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 and still not uh, a potential. It's still not uh, a reality. This is where she was taken from. And it says the chokhmas odom toyopano, who says the wisdom of a person will give beauty to his face. And this is a positive menu used many times 
And every time he uses from a different angle. What Terry Aleph says, Chokhmah's own Terry Ponov means that a wisdom of a person shines his way. Ponov means, where are you heading? Where are you facing? Right? So I'm facing this way. So a person is smart, he knows how to go. A person is not smart, you know. A fool is walking in the dark and so forth and so on. And here Rabbi says the Chokhmah's order, which means that wisdom of a person that is still jam-packed in his bones, it hasn't been extracted yet, that is the thing that brings the beauty to the face of his mate, of his bright mate. Well, can he know? That's why she's beautiful. Because that plethora of brain power was drawn to her. Because he adds a mat someone, because she is a bone, she's a part of him. She is a bone and an essence from his essence. She's a bone of his bones, of that person who hasn't reached yet a maturity, a maturity of mind, which means the bones are fat. They're really jam-packed. That's, that's why she gets it, and she's beautiful. And because his mind is still stored in his bones. And this is on a regular basis. Now we are moving towards the application of this principle as it applies to the Esrog and to Sukkot. In the Kavonis Lulav, uh, it says, you know, this Mitzvah Shem, we're going to go uh, into the Sukkot, this, you know, this uh, Sukkot, and we're going to have a Lulav, and with the Lulav, we're going to have that dust, and we're going to have that Rabbis, we're going to have the Esrog, and what we're doing here is we're shaking it up and down and left and right and forwards and backwards. And every time we go into the middle, those six directions of up, down, left, right, forward, and backwards, they represent the six sefirot of Zeranpin. As we said, you know, there are five levels, five personas, heavenly personas. You have the Saba, you have the Keser, the grandfather, Kulur Achamin. Then you have the Arichanpin, then you have the father, is Chochman Bino. And then you have the Zeranpin. Zeranpin, Arichanpin means a large face, and Zeranpin means a small face. The Arichanpin is the father and the mother, that's the parents. Zeranpin is the boy, the Machas is the girl. So Zeranpin represents the son, a lad, a state of, if you can call it, ladhood, for lack of another word. When we are shaking it, the, 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 in every single direction, every single uh, meter from the Zeranpin, the Chesed, the Gvura, the Tiferes, the Netzach, and the Hod and the Yesod, each one, each one had a, 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 a Bechina of Das, that it got all the way from Chochme and Bina. The Chochme and Bina are the one that fuel the various Midois, the various Midois with Das, with Seichel. And the job of Zeranpin per se is to be the transmission that brings the Chochme and Bina from, all the way from the Chochme, all the way down to the mouths. They are is, you know, like, you know, transmission of old, you know, you know the, the uh, you know, the manual transmission, you go, uh, 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 you know, used to move transmissions. Each one of the, the six sefirot of their Anpin, the six sefirot is a certain, you know, gear in the transmission, the first gear, second gear, third gear, and so on. And each one of them, each one of them is a special, has a special capacity to receive the raw primordial das as it comes from Chochmah Bino. And it's sort of like 
constricts the lights a little bit and in such a way that is able to give it through the sword and shine it into the malchus. The malchus, this is where everything comes to fruition. So he says, This is the, the root of the das, which are Chochmer Bina, they are coming into the Esrog, and I am the Kavonis. You should see in the Kavonis, Shar Kavonis, Sukha, Hey. And he says, The Sod Lulav Esrog, this is the secret of Lulav and Esrog, Ayin Sham. And he says, And to explain this a little bit, a little bit more, he says, Ke Ikira Kavona, the main thing that you're trying to do when you're shackling your lulav. So the hamshich el esrog is to bring over, to draw to the esrog, to deliver to the esrog, which is malchus. This is the malchus. The esrog represents the malchus. That's the wife, right? There's a p'chinas malchus, a p'chinas nekeva. To, to be mamshich to it, the moichin, the, the moichin shebaguf, hainu, the chasodim that exist in, that are now in the six directions of the Zerampi. He says, but it's not possible that they, those six servants will give, will shine this, the moichin to the Esra, unless they get the aura from Shoshama, the, the root of the moichin, the root of the Seichel, in other shosha chasodim shebadas, whereas where are the where are the six directions, where are the six spheres getting the dust, they're getting it from the root of all chasodim in the das. So this soda this is the secret of shokan the lulav, which means when you are shokan the lulav, just before we get we get just uh, let's make the picture a little bit bigger, and what we're saying is as follows. When you are shakoning the lulav, when you're going up and you're going down, going up and down is when you're going up, you're reaching to the shirsh, to the root of the das, the, sh- the root of the chasadim, while it's still within the, the, the das, you know, the chokhmah bin das, it's the rose, and then you bring it down through that particular sphere, the, the, one of the six directions, into the heart. The heart is the esra. You're holding together with the heart. And then you do the same thing to the right. You're going all the way to the right. You're reaching beyond, beyond that direction, beyond that sphere, to the root, to the primordial root of the chasadim, which is in the das. And then you're bringing it through that meter back into the heart. You're shining it into the esra. Then you're going... This direction. Again, you're stabbing all the way up in order to reach the very, very, and this, when, when you're getting there, you're shaking it. When you're shaking it, what you're doing is you are awakening, you are exciting the das in the chasodim to give him into that direction, into that sphere, through that sphere, back to your heart, back to the esra. The same thing is up. You're reaching up to the das, you're waking up the Orach HaSodim, you're shaking it, that's the reason we are shaking it, and you bring it down through that, that sphere, going down all the way to the heart, and you're shining into the Esher, the same thing, you're going down, you're going down, you're reaching again to the light, you're shaking it, you're waking up, you're exciting the motion, you bring it to the heart through that direction, Chesed, Gura, Tiferes, Netzach, Od, Yesod, all the way to the malchus, the esrog, which is y- your heart. This is the sword of Kavonus Lulav. Let's get back to the text here. And Rabbeinu says as follows. It says, Ki esrog. It is not possible that you will light up, give the enlightenment to the esrog. You have to get the illumination from the root of the moichin, the root of the chasodim, which exists in the level of das, is the moichin. That's the secret of the shockling of the lulav. You reach to the root, you shake to excite the, the moichin, the chasodim, bring it back with through that particular meter. If I was 
עיין שם לא נמצא, so you have found is therefore, שעיקר עשה אסרוג, the main illumination of the אסרוג, you're filling it up, מבחינת מלכוס, is how? through that, that, that Nisrabino Meir in Pchina Samoichin, that you, you bring down plenty of Moichin, plenty of mentalities, you know, that exi- from the Vavksas, in, from the six directions. How? Because you excited the Shorish Amoichin, the root of Amoichin in the Das. The Das gave it to the six directions, the six directions gave it to the Esrim. They, because they got it from the motion that are in the head, the Chochmah Vinadas. So this is in the beginning of Esra. Now we're going, Rabbein is going to explain what's the difference for what we said before. Every lad has a beautiful woman because, you know, the, the, the motion is still in his bones. He still didn't use them up. What's the difference between this and what we're doing on Sukkot? We're basically see, from the Zavav Ktsovis, which is now, which is there, Ampin, you're shining to the essence. So, what's the difference between the two? Now, Rabbin explains that. Is that Pchina Sanal? Aksham, that thing we answered before, Huna Mama, she's really a lad. He doesn't have the aura from the Mochin. The Mochin is still stored in his bones. Venisha Moichel Konus Bat Somos and his Moich is still stored in his bones. Velo Olo Lemala El Moichel. It still didn't go up to the mind yet. The mind still didn't mature. You know, it's still the raw material. And that's why, that's why he has a beautiful wife. But here, Bikdusha, when we're talking about when this action takes place in Kedusha, now you have to shine up, you have to light up the Esrim. I mean, you're a mature person. You're not a lad. So what you're doing here is a Bekdush Esrim, a Esrim, a Gedish of Shechim Bechavona. Deliberately, you are bringing down from the union of Moichin in the head, you're bringing down in the body. We'll talk in a minute, we'll talk about what does it mean that you're deliberately bringing to the, to the body. You're bringing it to a p'chinas gal, and that creates an abundance, an overabundance of moichin in the body. And from there, from the six directions, the six sefirot, you are a lad now, and that gives an abundance of moichin to the esrog, to the malchus. The Haven, Asen, the Kavonis, the Tavin, look well in Kavonis Arizal, and you understand the Zeb, Chinas, Sukkot, all this is the embodiment. And he says in this little Pasuk in Oshea, he says, Nar Israel Voyavei. Israel is a lad, and I love him. Which means when he is in a state of ladhood, as it were, is penis of love. The Ahav is a penis yamin. A love is chasadim. The penis chibuk yamin, that's the sukkah. Because a sukkah, what is, what is a sukkah? A sukkah is, the, the law of sukkah is uh, that you need to have two full walls and a tefach, a mashu. The third wall is just a little bit. That represents an embrace. When you embrace somebody, you have one arm, full arm, that's one full wall. Then you have the second wall, one full wall, and the tefach, that's the arm. The imino and his right hand, techabkenia, will embrace me. And embrace is presented with one wall, another wall, and a mashahu. That's the hechshah of a sukkah. Sukkah is all about love. That's the embrace of the right hand. This represents the essence of the sukkah. And all that is becoming a pchina snar Israel. When Israel is a pchina snar, pchina snar boichikanal, as the Tikkun Azir says, a crying lad. When the, cry, when the lad is crying, that brings an overabundance of rachamim and compassion. So let's sort of like bring it all to be, together for us to understand what does this mean for us. 
what we went through from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur, those 10 days represents all the 10 of wrote. The year, everything that is going to be each and every one of us has come from the highest Nakuda. You know, lift gates, you know, the lift the gates is for the Nikuda El to come down and to be mischaber with Nikuda Tachtoina. And this goes in Rosh Hashanah. The tzaddikim go up, the tzaddik, tzaddik ayamas, the tzaddik ayamas goes up to the point where it is beyond this prinus ainsel. The primamash prinus negeba ainsel. It's a nikuda eliono. It's the very beginning of the emanation of reality. And through the 10 days, it becomes more and more concretized through those tens of years until on Yom Kippur you have already created the seed of the new year. Whatever will be the, this new year that will be with you or happen to you, whatever now it's a seed. The Balatana has a marvelous mimer about Tkiyas Sefer that he explained that particular union. I'll just take just a little bit of something that he's saying. He says, look, the etzem asseichel, you know, the, the, the intelligence itself doesn't have a language. It needs letters afterwards, the letters of the machshava, the letters in your thought, to give voice, to give shape to the to the sechel amiti, to the intelligence. But in that realm of intelligence, it has no shape. It has no description. It's beyond grasp. Then you have those uh, that that particular mechanism which is the ability to enunciate, to break this uh, indivisible, unfathomable level of seichel and to give it an expression in the letters of the machshava, called the you know, in the level of the dibur. That goes through the five bechinas of Gvurais, which exist in the level of Bina. Bina has five tools with which to block that neutral flow of undifferentiated mind, undifferentiated intelligence. And through this set of five different blocks, it brings it down in a way that it can breaks into five chasadim, five gvuras all together make a tool. The same thing happens with the dibur. The same thing happens with everything when you see a tree growing, okay? The, the growth, the power of growth that comes from the ground is shapeless, okay? It goes into the limb of the tree and then it goes into a seed, a flower grows and a fruit is created. And inside the fruit, there's a seed. Now the seed from the fruit, that's the most gashmius manifestation of the original idea of the tree. The fruit is just a byproduct. I mean, the, 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 the meat, the flesh of the fruit, just a byproduct. So the animals or people will eat it and they will take the seeds and throw it somewhere else. So obviously that power, explains the Balatanian, to bring up the sap up the tree. The sap is, is, is raw material, has no shape. It is much, much higher, much more abstract 
then the seed, the seed is, is like a piece of wood. It's like, it's hard as a stone. But nevertheless, from the seed itself, from the seed itself, will come a brand new tree that can bring up its own sap, which is never, the, you know, the ability of a tree to bring up the sap and create fruits. This is the level of the unknowable level. That mechanism which already brings the sap and gives it to the sap and creates the fruit is, is much lower than actual sechel elion, but it's much higher than, 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 than the, uh, the seed. The seed is the end result. It's like as hard as a stone. It's very gashmistic. But as gashmius as it is, and as much slower as it is than the power that gave it life, that gave it creation, the mechanism that created it, it is much closer to the initial idea, to that unreachably, you know, unfathomable high uh, level of the, 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 the das, which is beyond anything. Because from that seed will grow up a whole new tree that can do the whole process in itself. The same thing exists with the Deber. The same thing exists when a person is about to give birth to a child. That there is a seed that is created in the mind. It has to go through the five hematosapes when you want to talk. You have the throat, you have the lips, you have the teeth, you have the back and so on. So the five and the tongue five of them, these are the five uh, gvurois that shape, that shape the dibur. That's the five gvurois that shape, you know, what will be in the bina. And ultimately, these are the five tortures in Nuyim that we torture ourselves on Yom Kippur. The fact that you don't eat, you don't wear shoes, you don't, you know, that, that, that whatever it is, you know, all the things of Yom Kippur, the five Inuim, those five represents the five, the, the Heimot Sasapeh, the five verse of the Bina. What you have at the end of Yom Kippur is a seed. When you finish Yom Kippur, you just have a seed. That seed needs to have a wife. That seed needs to have a womb. It has to be planted in a womb. That womb is the sukkah. That's why you have four days between Yom Kippur and sukkahs, because as as Chana says, Posach Dalte Bitni, that that Hakadosh has opened the doors of my of of my womb. Dalet, Dalte, Delet, doors, Dalet is four. Whenever there's an opening of a door, there's four, Dalet. Four days between Shabbos HaGodol and Pesach. That's why you learn a lot of Elohes from Pesach to, to Sukkot. You have four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. It goes, has to go through the door. And then it goes into, into Sukkot. Seven days of Sukkot. Why? Because you have to bring into the Malchus up, down, left, right, forwards and backwards, everything to the middle, the seven directions. It all ends up in Shmini Atzeres. Arizal explains Shmini Atzeres, this is when the seed is planted on the ground where it's supposed to be. The day after is the birth, is a Simchas Torah. Because what is born from this act of love that is happening from Rosh Hashanah, that's the male part, is going into the female part during Sukkot, the birth is Torah, that's Simchas Torah. So this is what Sichas Aran was about in this week. Uh, I don't know about you, but my mind is about paper thin right now. From everything that we went through, just on this Sicha 87 of Sichas Aran. So at least we have some kind of an idea. So just to recap, usually every boy, every lad has a nice woman. This is because the bone, the, 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 the brain never left the bones to go up to maturity. In Sukkot, the, the brain went up, but we brought it back down. 
back down to, to, you know, to ladhood, as it were. What does it mean? It means that during the Yom Neiroim, that including Rosh Hashanah, that including Yom Kippur, that includes Sukkot, we're going in without Chochmas. We're not sophisticated. We're not philosophizing. We're not trying to fix things. We're not trying to shine the, the you know, the, the porch and find out, you know, to fix that screw or whatever. Nothing. You were being lads. I'm coming, I'm sorry I did what I was not supposed to do. I wish I hadn't done it. I want to be circuit to all these things, all these incredible things that I inherit in Yom Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot. But what do I know? I have nothing to bring to the table. I have no mind. I'm not using the mind. This is what Rabbeinu says in Torah Shaf Beis that we learn on Thursday. There's a Pchinas Azus. That's the ferocity. That Azus, the Tuma is that you feel that everything is yours. You deserve it. You deserve anything. Azus, for us, it means that you want something you don't deserve. So betuma is you want the entire world. You want to swallow the entire world. Bikdusha, it means I want the Kodesh Baruch Hu to bring me closer even though I don't deserve it. And without this kind of decisiveness, this kind of ferocity, this kind of chutzpah, there's no way that you'll get it. There's no way that you'll get it from the seven shepherds. The Muna that give the Muna. Obviously, you can see where the, all the parallels, seven shepherds, the seven shiva in everything, the seven days, everything fits together as one piece. So, obviously, Monday night we're not going to have a shir. Hopefully, next time is Lekuta Maran on Thursday. Bli Neder, the Shkocha should help us all. I want to apologize for. Thursday night, Motsi and Kipper, it was long beyond the and there was too much action going on here, and I couldn't come around. So I do apologize.